Thanks everyone for coming. If everyone wants to take a seat, we'll get started in just a moment. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of OTI, I want you to know how much we appreciate your interest in our work, as well as your willingness to share your own experiences with us. My name is Amy Norell, and I'm a technologist at OTI. I am here today to represent OTI's Applied Best Practices and Coordination Team. Our team works across programs to support our staff, core performance management processes, and institutionalize a culture of learning. My primary area of expertise is geographic information systems, or mapping, as you may have heard it. But the needs of our staff and grantees have expanded greatly over the years. So I work closely with them to deliver the best technical assistance possible in other areas of information and communication technology. For today's discussion, I rounded up a group of my colleagues who have challenged me to be thoughtful about the application of technology in sensitive environments. I would like to take a moment uh, to have our panelists introduce themselves, starting with Noel. Hi, I'm Noel Dickover. I'm a senior program officer at the Peace Tech Lab at USIP. I head up a project called the Open Situation Room Exchange, which is a data and collaboration platform for peace builders and conflict zones. Uh, I'm Ian Schuler. I'm just here to loudly pour water while other people are talking. <laughs> Um, and in my spare time, uh, I'm at a group called Development Seed. We work on uh, geography, technology, and data, which made us incredibly appropriate for this panel, uh, and have previously worked at, at State and at NDI on applying technology to uh, political development. Hi all, I'm Jessica Heinzelman. I'm manager of ICT strategic initiatives at DAI. I've been working at the cross-section of tech and development since about 2008. Um, and I'm really excited to be here today to talk both about um, work that we're doing at DAI as well as possibly dive back into some of my previous life um, with groups such as CC Niamani in Kenya that had an SMS uh, peace text service as well as Ushahidi. Good morning. I'm here to drink the water that Ian poured. <laughs> <laughs> no. Loudly. No, um, I'm Ivan Sigal. I'm the executive director of Global Voices and a fellow at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society. Um, I've worked for about 15 years on um, media development, internet projects, um, conflict zones, transitional societies, natural disasters, and many other contexts, mostly in the former Soviet Union and all over Asia, and now with Global Voices globally as well. Thanks, you guys, for being here. So our panel will look at how technology helps our staff to understand countries in transition and support our local partners as those transitions take place. A transition is a time of significant political change. The environment is complex and dynamic. In return, our programs must be flexible and creative. That makes understanding the appropriate use of technology a constant process of discovery and critical reflection. An important part of that process is having forums like we have here today, so that we can dig in and talk about what's working and what's not in practice. Today, I will provide a brief look at how, how OTI has used technology over the years. Then, I will turn to our panelists to reflect on those lessons and help us look ahead. At the end, we will have time for your questions and to help us get through as many of those as possible, we ask that you write your questions on note cards and hand them to my colleague, Meg Young, who's sitting up here in the front row. So if you all just wouldn't mind filtering those her way. So if you'll join me, let's take a brief look at how OTI has used technology over the years. In 1998, Tom Stuckel, a senior advisor at OTI, was overlooking riots from his hotel room in Jakarta. But Tom had an entirely another problem. He was tired of sorting through dozens of spreadsheets and documents to manage OTI's small grants. So Tom bid his time in lockdown by teaching himself Microsoft Access. And that night, the OTI Activity Database was born. 
Over the years, the database was customized to the needs of our programs. We have used it to track and evaluate more than 25,000 small grants around the world. Many technical solutions from the early days of OTI are still relevant. Today, we support the development of tools, such as field papers and first mile geo, to integrate the use of paper and digital methods for managing information. But back at the turn of the century, OTI also started to use technology to, to directly support our grantees. We conducted research on media consumption and helped communities access and share information. Our grantees built internet centers and taught courses in computer literacy. And once they were online, we supported trainees to teach them how to use email and blogs. We also stood up radio towers to bring broadcasts to, re to remote places and help TV managers develop objective quality content. And we funded trainings on digital security for journalists. From these early interventions, we learned that some issues like bridging digital gaps and providing access to real-time information are just too big for us as an office to tackle alone. Now we look to our colleagues inside governments, civil society, and the private sector to help us face these issues together. There's still important work to be done in building these strategic partnerships. But to support requests for technical assistance, we have also staffed up in Washington. In 2006, OTI hired technologists to help our programs collect, analyze, and visualize data. And there was some initial skepticism, but the unit won the office over, map by map. These maps focused our, administration, our administration's attention on pressing issues. At the time, there was a situation in Sudan. Now we are looking to Syria and Ukraine. Our products continue to inform policy discussions in Foggy Bottom and prog program decisions on the ground. Our technologists are dedicated to support specific country programs. They work directly with program staff and grantees to understand the potential of new technologies. Take social media platforms. Our government and our office is built on the idea that everyone around the world deserves a voice in public life. That includes supporting the voices of individuals who often go unheard in closed environments. A vibrant civil society and independent media are key to democracy and governance. Our grantees are looking to new digital tools to help them shape and tell their story. In 2007, our program in Lebanon supported a network of civil society organizations who were interested in using social media. Their goal was to promote civic engagement and social cohesion across long-standing sectarian divides. So we built the capacity of a local partner, Social Media Exchange, to train these organizations how to use digital tools for advocacy. Today, Social Media Exchange is a thriving organization, and they are helping other organizations throughout the Middle East. Over the years, our grantees have learned that effective campaigns blend the use of new digital tools like social media with traditional methods of communication like the arts. In Burma, the Myanmar ICT for Development Organization, or MIDU, is doing just that. They launched a campaign on Facebook where you can find photos and illustrations of people with flowers in their mouths, a powerful image to protest against hate speech. OTI was patient in making the decision to fund MIDU to protect local ownership and direction of the campaign. OTI has also funded the use of mobile technology in certain contexts. In 2008, we funded researchers at the University of California at Berkeley to train local students how to conduct perception surveys in northern Uganda. They developed a mobile data collection application that's now called Kobo Toolbox. Our program was able to co quickly collect information and tailor reconciliation activities to community priorities. OTI has also supported the use of mobile technology to spread targeted messages of peace, to pay grantees using mobile money, to push news to rural areas, and to provide information on how to participate in key transition processes such as elections. Where low penetration and literacy rates constrain the use of mobile messaging, we are exploring viable alternatives. In Mali, communities can provide feedback and help design small grants 
by contacting an OTI-funded call center where they can speak to someone in their local language. Today, in 2014, OTI is focusing more on the process behind using technology rather than a suite of tools. Our program in Honduras is using community mapping to understand crime in high-risk neighborhoods. This mapping is part of a broader effort to build confidence and trust between communities and local police. And now we are exploring the use of digital gaming as a way to bring youth into this conversation and imagine a better reality. Because sometimes all we need are the tools to help us see our problems differently, to help us see each other differently. At OTI, our mission isn't to use a specific technology. Our mission is to support local partners as they define peace and democracy on their own terms. But we also recognize that there's still a lot for us to learn in this area and to share with each other. We're excited about the opportunities that lay ahead, and we're excited to work with you all. So on that note, I'd like to throw a couple of questions to our panelists. And I'll start with you, Jessica. Our grantees are using new technology as a way to bring communities together and engage in peaceful, constructive activities. One of the most significant lessons that we have learned is to approach the use of technology as a conversation rather than a predetermined solution or tool. We support a design process whereby our grantees identify what is right for their community. So I'm wondering, based on your experience at DAI and in other spaces, um, what have you learned in terms of best practices in being able to deliver quality technical assistance to the field? Sure. Um, yeah, I guess when we talked the other day, I was really excited about that phrasing of approaching technology as a conversation. Um, and the more I thought about it, I was like, well, how do I talk about this? Because it just makes sense. And I think what I think, if there's one thing you walk away um, with from this panel, it's that good technology design and development and the best practices for technology and development are really the best practices for development. And for some reason, technology just throws a wrench into it and it's like a blocker. It's like, well, you know, saying, going into a situation and saying, we should develop an app is the same as going in and saying we should have a community event. And unless you have the context and the objectives behind that idea, um, it, it can go poorly um, and really not get you the impact you need. So I think what, we, what I do a lot at DAI and what our team has done is integrate um, technology through processes that include conversations both with local staff um, who know the project, know the country, know the context, know what they're trying to achieve, as well as conversations with those that are the end users. And I think you know it's sometimes really easy to stop short of that. Um, and I'd like to share just one brief example from some work that we've done in Sierra Leone, um, where I was brought in under a DFID project that we run there that is supporting uh, women's access to security and justice, or the larger project is a security and justice project. But we were charged with the task of um, reaching 700,000 women and girls with better information about what their rights were and how to access them, and to put an, in rural Sierra Leone. So to put that in perspective, that's 23% of the female population. Um, and I spent the first week, week and a half, just going around uh, Freetown, the capital, talking to NGOs, understanding how they're already communicating, what, understanding the ecosystem um, and how information was shared. Um, but then I could have stopped there. And I think that's, um, you know, something that we oftentimes do d due to time constraints or resource constraints. And we were really lucky in this uh, in this case because we were able to take an additional two weeks and travel out to the most rural areas of Sierra Leone um, and really test our assumptions and test the assumptions of people that were in the capital. Um, and I went as far as one village that was about 10 hours outside of Freetown and I chose it specifically because my staff said that it had no access to the mobile network and it had no radio coverage. And I said, well, if we can reach, and it was, one of, it was a very conservative Muslim community. And I said, if we can reach these girls, we will be able to reach anybody. Um, 
And what I actually found was we, we did focus groups with girls, with women, and men separately, which was really important. And we found that in that community, surprisingly, girls had the best access to mobile phones. Because unlike in some of the closer in villages uh, where they could, you know, their parents could just pick up the phone and make calls, in this village, the parents didn't have time to walk five miles to go pick up messages, so they would send their children. So what ended up happening is there are a bunch of girls on top of a mountain <laughs> with complete freedom to call whoever they wanted. <laughs> um, which was, was, was really wonderful to see that. What we also found in that village was that um, a lot of the young men had small boom boxes that they were listening to music on memory cards. And we took away from that um, this idea that, wow, you know, we want to integrate different types of technology. So we knew we were going to do radio. We knew we were going to have some sort of mobile phone. Uh, but we could also have information that could stay in that community for when it was, when it was desired. And I think we built an integrated uh, project design that allowed people to access different types of information, whether they wanted to pull information or if it was broadcast information. Um, but really, people could either access all of them as a really complimentary suite, or they could um, you know, just get access to what they, what they had. Um, and I think it was a really interesting, I like to share that story because um, it's important to challenge our assumptions and really understand where people are at and know that they're, you know, oftentimes people that are doing really great work in the capital cities don't have the time or aren't looking for these little details. So I'll leave it there and continue the conversation. Great. If anyone wants to jump in on that conversation, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I spent three years at the State Department and now the last year at, at USIP. State, we developed something called the Tech Camp project. I don't know how many folks are familiar with this. Very cool. It's still ongoing, doing great, but we went there, they've gone to now I think about 30 countries. Um, and and what, what we found is a lot of the innovation you're going to find in developing countries are with the local technologists. And so finding ways to almost bring together local tech with local civil society, not in a panel thing, but small group discussion, really engaging on both understanding what's possible in that context, but then coming up with innovative solutions. And what we come to the table with, we come from a place where we have ubiquitous power and ubiquitous connectivity for everything we do, and that's just not the world these folks live in. But the local technologists know what's possible, how they can work, who's doing what and where, and if you can get them engaged on social good projects, at least in my experience, they love it just as much as people in New York or Paris or anywhere else. They just haven't had that opportunity. So finding ways that we can start sort of cultivating this tech for social good ecosystem, which exists in a New York, in a Paris, and really in a Mexico City, in, in a Bangkok, in some places like that, and, and really connect this better, what you're going to find is the solutions that are coming up with are far more innovative, generally more low cost, and, and are much more of this agile prototyping ways, because there's really not money there to do stuff, but they're able to get things done anyways. A good example, we call the Peace Tech Exchanges at USIP. We did a series of three of these in Iraq. In the first one, it was around uh, corruption, we had uh, a journalist there who was really looking to just track violence against journalists. Iraq is, in the, over the last 10 years, I think number three or four in, in, in terms of deaths for journalists, and he hooked up with Jorge Luis Sierra, who in Panama and then in Mexico had done this great platform, an event platform for capturing uh, corruption complaints and actually doing it from a journalist's perspective. He's now at ICFJ, and he worked with him first to set up an event platform that he had set up in Mexico, tied it to a blog-based uh, setup. The model we have at USIP is we give them small awards afterwards to see if they're able to make something amazing happen. And in his case, he was. He was able to connect with 30 different journalists and start working a connection with the, the government office that, that, that oversees this. And so now we're looking to give him a larger grant to continue. This was his idea that he worked with a technologist, not from the United States at the time. Uh, but moving forward, the idea is how do we cultivate local leaders and sort of change the focus from things outsiders want to figure out how to solve to things insiders see as a problem that they think they can address and find ways to empower them. And to me, connecting to local tech is, is a terrific way to get that innovation. Jump on this real quickly. So there's a thing in ICT for dev in, in, in our little geeky community called Failfare. 
And Fail Fair is a place where a bunch of people who are doing tech and development get together, get drunk, and talk about the awful things, the, the horrible ideas that they've had over the years. And I've done a few. I think, Jessica, you've done at least one, right? Or am I yeah, making that I up? So. Yeah. I've actually won some. I've been the biggest loser, the biggest failure at a number <laughs> of these events. And I would love to tell you that you go to Fail Fair and you see all of these really interesting failures because people are at the very edge of applying technology to development, and they're, and they're asking the questions that have never been asked before and coming up with the interesting new solutions. And that's not the case at all. Basically, 80% of them fail because somebody here had an idea that this was going to be really cool, and of course everybody there was going to need it and want it and like it, and then that didn't actually work out to be the case. Uh, and so just basic market research and basically going out and, and and, and being part of, you know, engage, the sort of stuff that Jessica talks about is so important. Uh, and, like, there's a lot of excuses we could give, or reasons and, and excuses we could give for why this doesn't happen. The funders and the funding model would be easy to blame, and that's partly true. How we're structured as an organization would be, or as organizations as an industry would be easy to blame, and that's partly true. Uh, all of this contributes to that. We need to find a way to get past that. Uh, and I think that's something that I'm uh, excited to, ex to discuss with you guys. So thanks for raising those important considerations. And I'd actually like to build off of some of your points in terms of the design process. So an important decision is balancing the desire to support open data initiatives as an office uh, against the need to respect grantee privacy. Uh, so Ian, I was wondering if you might just start us off by discussing how we should approach that topic. Yeah, I mean, and I think, uh, look, w dealing with open data is something that you need to deal with responsibly. Um, I, I, I hesitate to, to post it as, a, as opposite sides. Like, you can care about privacy and, and individual security and also care about openness and transparency at the same time. Uh, there are certainly policy issues that you need to figure out. For OTI, very specifically, uh, you know, how do you be as open as possible, show taxpayers you're making good use of their money, give them some ability to have some insight into why you're making decisions, but also not do things that are going to be counterproductive to exactly what you're trying to do for taxpayers, not put out information on grantee names or beneficiary names where that would risk the, the, the program itself. Uh, but also, you know, so that's one side of it. And then the other side of it is, we as development practitioners need to be more thoughtful about the data of individuals that we're working with, the data of beneficiaries. And we often don't have this conversation. Uh, we are, for very good and noble reasons, collecting a lot of data to give to our donors to show that we're actually doing things and making an impact. And, and, uh, and, and that's all uh, powered by well-intentioned um, uh, goals. But at the same time, that's a lot of data that we're not necessarily telling the beneficiaries what we're collecting, what's going to happen to that, that it's going to a UX government entity. And there are certainly real concerns that we, about that as well. So finding ways to get the benefits of doing good evaluation, of tracking that things are happening and what the impacts are, while anonymizing that data and pulling and taking out some of that personally identifiable information is just something that is possible to do. It's done more, in, certainly in the medical field than in others, and something that we could, we could be better at. We just need to be, be thoughtful about it. The other aspect that maybe we want to talk about also is the larger industry side. I mean, I think I feel like most of this of that stuff is is solvable. Um, there's also sort of a a we are participating in an industry that likes to collect a lot of information. If you're doing a, a, a political campaign, you want to get as much info as possible. Uh, how do we? There we go. Hey, hey we're, we're back live. Okay. So, uh, to to cut to the chase, like how how do there there is this larger question about data in in the industry and uh, and you know, not just the individual program that we're doing, but when all of this comes out, when we're supporting satellite projects and we're supporting um, you know the cool app, what happens to all this data and how are we contributing to this overall? I mean, what's referred to as the mosaic effect, the ability to pull a lot of this data that exists in different places and find out a lot of personal information uh, about individuals. How do we make sure that that we're handling that responsibly? It's it's 
within technology, as a, as a technologist engineer, there's a really, there's a gray area between really, really awesome things you can do with data and really, really creepy things you can do with data, and how do we set the right standards so that we know we're doing as much awesome as possible with as little creepy as possible. Um, I just wanted to add to that, which I also, you know, there's one, there's a role for OTI and other implementers um, in thinking through these things, but I think it's also important to decentralize the decision making about risk, but doing so in a way where we're really making sure that people are informed and making decisions based on knowledge. Um, I think, you know, the, the activists that are out there working, uh, particularly with OTI projects and grantees, have been making decisions about how much they're willing to risk for decades. Um, and technology doesn't change that. Um, you know, before they were just making a decision about which coffee shop that they wanted to have that conversation in or who's home. And now they have to make a decision about you know, what technology they're gonna communicate through and how to protect themselves. Um, and I think it's also one of the things, Amy, I was glad to hear in the, in the recap of the things that OTI has been doing, and definitely something that we do at, at DAI, is make sure that we are um, providing education on security uh, so that people really have the knowledge of where these new risks lie as they adopt these new technologies um, and can, can choose for themselves. Yeah, I, I'd just like to jump in on that. I think. Um, one of the assumptions that we make about um, conversation, going back to your original point, is that a conversation exists on a, on a neutral platform in which everybody who is on the platform has equal ownership or equal say. And being extremely careful and aware that um, projects that are designed um, by implementers and by with, with donor resources are already creating a presumption of ownership in which we, you, as um, as implementers with the resources and the ones collecting the data uh, have a, a larger stake or a larger position on the, uh, the success and also on, on what kind of voice is occurring on those platforms. So in the work that I do, we, we don't presume and we don't design projects on the basis of external agency or external focus, but on the basis of local agendas. And what that means on a real basis is actually starting with the resources. So. I think there's also a larger kind of strategic conversation to be had around how technology works, not just um, not just at the, at the technical implementation level, but also on how that affects the very political development processes themselves. And uh, I'll stop there for the moment. Yeah. Just to follow up on Jessica's point with, with the education and training, it, it's a really scary thing if you're working in a harsh environment, authoritarian government, whatever, if you're not a technologist, to figure out what should you be using to organize and to communicate and, and to actually conduct your actions. And, and the real problem is the list of risks change on a regular basis and you're not aware of it. So let's say you get some terrific security training today. Six months from now, you're not quite sure, you know, like when Skype changed to be Microsoft owned and they went to sort of a hub and spoke model, what was the implication if the host government or wherever you're at was able to penetrate that. And how would you know if it was still safe to work Skype? Fact is you don't, unless you've got you know, a pipeline to EFF or you know, somebody like that who, who knows this stuff. And I almost think there's a need for a similar uh, field to see what Symantec does with their antivirus center or something like that. Something for technology that if there's some group that could say, hey, here's the risks that are coming about from uh, you know, mobile platforms, from IP, from these collaborations, things, and somebody that can actually almost keep pace with these, you know, this co-evolution uh, of how do you have secure technologies with people trying to penetrate it at the same time. If there was somewhere you could go to basically get the update on the stuff that you're using, I mean, I, I know that corollary break, breaks down at some level, but if there's ever a need for a center of expertise, especially for activists working in these environments that can just tell them, here's our best guess, globally and oh by the way within you know Egypt here's the stuff you need to worry about that would be terrific and it, it's really needed and is not there right now so. and if you think that's a good idea there are a number of other people who have tried and started to do this so before you come up with your own uh, version of this to pitch go talk to some of those people and either collaborate or learn from them 
Yeah, people have been working on this for at least 10 years, actually. And there's a, there's, <laughs> there's a huge amount of, uh, especially local resources and local capacity, um, in, because activists have their own concerns at heart, obviously, and so they, they're taking this very seriously. And I also want to say that in that context, it's, I think it's really important to double, to stress again the idea that individuals determine their own level of risk and um, are often the best place to, to understand what that risk is. And uh, we should, with all of our projects, should be operating on a do no harm principle, and especially that comes to things like data collection, data sharing, and some of the implications that around that. Um, really not instrumentalizing technology is a, is a, crucial, a crucial idea here in the context of, of what we do. And on that note, I'd like to pick up on a thread that I heard, which I think Ian raised, which was the mosaic effect of combining different data sets, and pose a question to you, Noel, which is at OTI, we use data to help us challenge assumptions and make educated decisions about our programs. We sometimes really struggle, though, with digging through data from disparate sources and really packaging it in a way um, that's actionable, putting all the caveats on how it was sourced. Uh, so we know that this is not a struggle that's unique to OTI, so I wanted to turn for, to you and some of the work that's being done at the Peace Tech Lab to, to ask you, are there, are there breakthroughs that you think are coming down the pike to help us? Well, we have an idea. So we're, we're trying this, and it's sort of like if you look at sort of the realm of, of data systems that are out there, there's so many of what we refer to as these data for Superman systems, right? If I just get this really important person, everything they need at the moment they need, at the time they need, they're going to make some magical decision, and then the problems of northern Nigeria will just dissipate, right? And, and there's a lot of these systems. But if what we believe is it's, it's really the, the local population and their expectations for the future, and are they going to start moving towards nonviolent ways to, to you know, mediate their disagreements? If, if that's what we see is what's going to change northern Nigeria and places like that, in our terms, it's really the local peace builders who should be having this fancy situation room that all the data comes and is really geared towards their needs. And of course, there's a number of challenges with that. Uh, people in DC like to be data driven. I think it's fair to say we struggle with that, and some are and many aren't. That's even harder in a conflict zone. But if you don't own your own data profile, right, and so often we see we engage this great group of stakeholders locally, we do an assessment, and then what do we do? We leave and do the analysis. And then we show back up with the answer, right? I mean, it's the classic, let me give you a fish. And, and so what we're trying to do is, in, in, we're in prototyping stages, but uh, osrx.org, OS, yeah, osrx, open situation room exchange.org, or osrx.org, we're looking to build a platform that, that's really geared more, not as the inside out perspective, but an outside in perspective, meaning finding ways to ask them what is the information they care about, about the world around them, and actually helping them think through how they could find collect, analyze, visualize, and publish conflict data. In, in long term, the hope is that we can get what we call a conflict zone fellow, which is a really great technologist there interested in social good, bring them back to our lab for six months, learn about conflict analysis, uh, mediation and facilitation skills, along with data analysis and visualization, have them go back to a physical place that they could put maps on the wall, bring folks in so over a period of time, they start thinking through what are the questions they want answered. And they're probably not going to be getting a nice little 3D visualization data cube kind of thing. It's more a set of alerts to their cell phones. Uh, this is going to be a long-term effort, but the hope is if we can find ways to give them their own situation room that they can ask the questions, that their strategy and tactics will reflect that. And hopefully, if you improve their performance, our thought is that's going to be the best chance to you know, really address places like your northern Nigerias and things like that. This is a really challenging issue, um, and the silver, like, silver bullets, almost, as, as we know, they don't exist. Um, one of the things that we find, uh, I think, again and again with the development of very specific, narrow affordance technologies is that they tend not to be used very well because they're built in such a way as to be so targeted for a very specific population that they, t they require a huge amount of training, and in the meanwhile, the world progresses. So I've seen a lot of uh, attempts to build things like mesh networking for conflict or um, specific mobile-based applications for reporting that require a huge amount of learning on the part of the individual, but then um, something else outside of that specific application is going to come along and overwhelm the specific effort to build that one thing. So I'd caution against trying to build projects that focus so narrowly on a particular problem 
that they are designed to fix that one thing because they tend not to actually work over time. Kind of drawing from both uh, what Noel and, and what Ivan were saying, I mean, I think as, as far as approach goes, I couldn't agree more that if we really uh, think in development, we, some of the best work that we do is to provide data and provide information that allow individuals in those environments to be making their own decisions, whether it's decisions about risk or decisions about policies or what have you. I think the, the way to do this that probably doesn't work is to have a, you know, as I've been saying, come in, build a data center for X and have this be the hub of blah, blah, blah. I think what is more useful is investing in data infrastructure overall and see it the same as you're investing in a road network and a, a human capacity network. You're investing in a data data network or, or, or a data infrastructure that other people can use, can repurpose, can plug into, and when situations change, use that data in different ways, combine it with different different information. And that's what generates economic activity. That's, that, that's data that generates uh, transparency, accountability. Uh, OTI has great data. You guys have really good data, and you have really great ways of turning that data into useful products. I've had a chance to see some of the stuff that you've done and it, I mean, my frustration with it is, man, it would be really great if this was more available. I know that you guys do more than most to make it available to your implementing partners and others, but some of this data would just be tremendously beneficial if there are ways to, to, that you could find to, to make it open. I know that there's a lot of, it, it's not an easy ask, um, but, but I think that thinking in terms of, hey, we're not just here to provide, provide money resources, providing data is just as valuable of a resource that we can provide and actually more appropriate in certain situations than throwing money at problems. I'd like to add one more thing, which is I think now that there's so much activity online and we have Facebook and we have text messages and there's all this big data, I think sometimes we're drawn to that as the answer and losing sight of the fact that there's still a lot of small, little data, little little data, little data. small the, data. I'm not sure that there actually is much big data developing. <laughs> I, think, like, we're, I think we just don't have access to it. <laughs> I, think, I think it's there. Um, but, but even that said, it doesn't mean that it's the best. You know, there have been all these crowdsourcing initiatives, and there are a lot of them that you know, should be presenting or have presented at the fail fairs, just because <laughs> you, know, you have all this data, but what are you going to do with it? I know um, in, in my grad school internship, I managed um, one of the early elections monitoring projects for Ushahidi. Um, and what we got back was 40% of reports were saying, you know, go peace, yay Kenya. They were all very positive. But really, it looked like these huge issues on the map, you know, and it was really just like bubbles of happy people. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> it was like silly. And people were like, oh my gosh, what's going on in the Rift Valley? And it's like, peace, peace is going on. And I think that we need to really look. Um, still at these local networks and invest in creating our own more um, relevant data networks and then attaching them to technology and not thinking, okay, well, it's either crowdsourcing or key informants. I think one of the organizations that I've worked with that I mentioned earlier is CC Niamani. What we actually did was go in and identify local peace activists, work with them to identify issues in their community. And then we brought in experts um, to run focus groups on message development so that when an issue arose, they could go to this framework and create a message that was actually going to mitigate or disrupt violence. Uh, and then they would send it in and would go through a quality control process and then get blasted out, um, targeted to the people that, that were signed up for the subscription for the peace messages in that area. And we had about 65,000 people across Kenya signed up um, that would get these messages. And I think that kind of data um, and still looking at kind of what we can do at a small level, but tying it uh, and amplifying its impact through technology is, is really important to, to not think that we have to go either one way to the extreme or the other way to the extreme. 
Thanks, everyone. So we're about to step into our final question for the panelists before going into Q&A. So on that note, um, if you have questions, I encourage you to write those on your note cards and funnel them up to a MedCures in the front row. So if you wouldn't mind just passing those her way, that would be great. Um, so in closing, I'd like to step back and recognize um, that we really are in a notable point in terms of the application of information and communication technologies to development. The pace of research and development is accelerating. Well, on the other hand, we run against constraints when it comes to really integrating technology into the plumbing of how we design and provide assistance. Technology innovation is outpacing process innovation. So on that note, I'd maybe like to throw a question to you, Ivan, at the end. Um, moving forward, how can we help our industry tackle this challenge? <laughs> well, man. <laughs> Ian, can I have some more water? <laughs> Just shake it loudly next time. Exactly. So, um, a couple of points on this, I think, um, that maybe can help us shape the conversation. Innovation is not a value in itself. I think it's really, really important. I mean, we have a, a tendency, and I think this town has a tendency to latch on to a word and a concept and every and pick up a, you know, and then imbue it with a lot of value that maybe is overstating the case. Innovation is about, um, about is a tactic for understanding change, but without a direction, it really doesn't mean very much. So I, I really urge us to not use innovation as a measure or a lens for the way we think about technology application. But start instead with, um, and, and just one very simple example of what that means. Um, a lot of times technology conversations will, will think about the sharpest or most interesting or most uh, kind of innovative moment of technology change in a way that ignores, uh, um, I guess, what I would say is simple applications of te technology that are appropriate to environments and communities based on their current practices. And so oftentimes, technology use is based on, is not going to be based on whether or not I have the best smartphone or Apple makes a new product that somehow overwhelms our practices, but based on a small and incremental change based on the particular location and, and access a, a particular community has at a given moment. And if we start from that mindset um, and think about things like resiliency of networks and the strength of the infrastructure underlying the systems that we have, I think it's a, it's a more useful place to, to help us understand what is and is not possible. And you can just apply your own experience to this. I mean, when I buy a new phone or when I think about accessing a new network, I'm learning incrementally what that thing is. And uh, I'm not expecting that there's going to be a, a technology change that's going to overwhelm necessarily uh, what my process might be. So there's certainly conversations that we can have about technologies that will come in that will, and, and, has, and we have seen, that have a revolutionary or disrupting effect. But that isn't necessarily where most of the work is going to be happening, I think. Just a different uh, part entirely of this. I think it's a large enough question we could probably hit on five completely separate areas. And, and what I want to touch on is, is really the whole funding model for development, right? I, I think most of the places that we're working, we all agree that uh, long-term behavior change is what we're looking for ways to galvanize. And generally, that doesn't get done in one-year increments. Right? So, so you have these projects that get started, and there's nobody locally that thinks they're going to be long-term. There's maybe people in DC aren't really sure. And, and, and really, until we start thinking about different revenue streams, it's going to be hard to have long-term projects. Case in point, what we're thinking about with, with this, this OSRX site I was talking about, uh, one of the things, if we get a local presence there, if we could start developing crowd-seated networks, very similar to what Sissi Niamani did, which is a terrific project, to be able to start getting real-time data on a number of variables that can help us understand what's happening in the conflict, both from an economic security perspective, you know, you think about those. That same network is going to be really valuable, for instance, to potentially insurance companies looking to gauge political risk if somebody wants to put an energy plant there, right? There's a number of ways that we can find that people outside the peace building space might find value in that data, not as a conflicting thing, but something that actually potentially enables jobs. How can you, you have all these wonderful engineers who can't find jobs in these places? How can we you know, connect them to people looking for expertise externally? So it could be that 
the data networks we're trying to build this, you know, cultivation of, you know, this tech for social good ecosystem in these conflict zones may have some real beneficial revenue streams that we can use to fund the peace building activities. This is just merely one idea here. Uh, look at what Nat Geo has done, right? That is just amazing programming that they're able to use in a number of ways. Can we do that with some of our conflict sensitive media programs? Uh, it's really just, it's a beginning thought, but figuring out how you can actually monetize some of the things you're doing so you're not relying on grants and donors and you know federal money that's going to get cut off at some point because otherwise the folks locally don't see this as a long-term effort either they see it as a short-term gain that maybe you're helping them and they're helping you but it's not necessarily something that they can rely on long term so. sure. uh, <clears throat> quickly, I, mean, I, I think um, you know, I've seen a lot of technologists or engineers want to go help NGOs and, and they'll lend their services, and that almost never works for a variety of reasons, but largely it's because as, as, a, as an industry, we're not really set up well to do tech well in a lot of ways. There's some things we're, we're pretty good at, and I think that actually some of what, Ivan, what you described is, is what I would argue we're better at. We're better at sort of applying technology in incremental ways to improve the stuff that we already understand. We're not really good at understanding how to organize differently, to retool differently, or coping with the fact that, that entirely that, that things are shifting, that economies are shifting, that industries are shifting, that the way people expect to get information from their elected representatives is all shifting. Uh, we're not really good at that. We're not good at, at, um, at designing technology <laughs> interventions that, that can accommodate the sort of risk that can go into it saying, we think these things are important, but we're not exactly sure what the outcome's going to be. I mean, you would never get funding for that, but that's exactly the sort of stuff that's, that's required to do technology well. So we're not necessarily structured uh, as, an, as an industry to be able to do all aspects of, uh, some of these aspects well. But it is something that I do think we need to get better at, um, and we need to figure out ways to, to address. I've seen a number of, environment, of, of disaster response environments where people are still sharing information through PDFs of Esri maps that then are impossible to actually do anything with once you get them, and we, that's irresponsible. We can't be. We, we have to be better than that. Uh, we have to be better than that today. And, we, and these are things we need to figure out. Um, yeah, I, I actually want to just um, mention something about OTI in particular since we're celebrating this anniversary. But I think that when when my team goes to work with an OTI project. I get excited because I actually do think that the funding model that you have that's a bit more agile is better suited to try new things and to innovate in all the right ways, not the jargony way. Um, but the, the ability to, you know, really the emphasis on the field, the knowledge coming from local populations, the ability to give small grants, I think one of the things in the, in the larger uh, industry that doesn't work is you're given a one to two year grant with a with a delivery item with a deliverable at the end um, but there's so much that can happen um, to learn in between that and that iterative approach really is important to make sure you get to the to the right end um, and there's a lot that we I think there's just a lot more opportunity on OTI projects where you have a little bit more flexibility and and you know, you can have smaller funding and be able to do that on an incremental scale. Thanks, now we'll shift over to some questions from the audience. Our first question is, we struggle with measuring and understanding changes in abstract complex topics like stability. What technologies does the panel see to help us understand change in these topics? I'll take a stab on it because this is a problem we have to get our arms around, right? I mean, there's there's a real need to have solid metrics for what we do, but but you know, especially in the peace building field, trying to prove a negative isn't always your your you know best option. But <clears throat> to me, it, it's it's getting back to uh, real time data indicators that that can give you senses of you know, like so. For instance, everybody right now is looking at Ebola as a health crisis in West Africa, which it clearly is, and that's the main thing. But just as clearly, there's an economic security impact for stability, and I've seen nobody collecting a lot on that. If there is, I would love to see it. Uh, it there's a number of pieces like that. So, you know, somebody referenced First Mile Geo, I think, earlier. I, I think one of the neat things Matt McNabb did with, with Syria, which was pretty cool, and early on is looking at that conflict, he, he got people to go in there and, <clears throat> excuse me, just go to bakeries and find out the price of bread in both rebel areas 
and in the the Assad control areas, and it was sun is a daily feed. And at the beginning, uh, the Assad areas it was a lot higher, and the rebel areas it was lower until Assad cut off their supply routes. And then there was a dramatic shift, which gave you indications of what was occurring, you know, both from food security but also stability and things like that. So to the extent that we can start getting real-time indicators of what's happening, I think that gives you one sense of stability. I think there's some of the longer-term trends that, that hit there as well, but, but I don't think we're ever going to bring this down to, you know, a number because so much of this gets onto these, you know, whatever you call these, these leverage inflection points where things just sort of shift, and at least from what we've seen from a data perspective, it's really hard to predict, uh, you know, from, you know, the Soviet Union breaking up on down. I mean, these things are not easy. To, ah, that's happening next month. You just can't do that. So, so this is a difficult problem. I, I wish I had a great answer, but, but I think the thing we have to hold against is not putting forward what we all know to be fake metrics and try to get judged on that, but to actually do the hard work of finding ones that are real and, and, and make a difference. So. Yeah, just to, just to add to that, um, especially with large, complex topics like that, we're sort of forecasting our own values. And, um, and if you choose a metric that is maybe inappropriate to the particular conditions and you, and you judge your work on that basis, you might miss the point. And uh, sometimes stability is a good thing, and sometimes, you know, it's not a good thing. And um, like, uh, autocracies can be very stable. And so I would, I would urge us to think about, if you're going to apply a metric like that, apply it in combination with other ideas, and maybe don't necessarily think of it as a vector for, or a goal, but as a, as a more empirical measure that you can look at in combination with other ideas about what's occurring in the place that you're studying and try to reserve some judgment about its, about its meaning and implication. Because if you take that, if you take that perspective, you'll have a, uh, I think, a, um, a data set that is both, that is more reflective of the reality in the context. I think also, um, we're not there yet, but I'm excited to see where some of, where data and analytics go. Um, you know, for 25 years, uh, conflict and political scientists have been looking at you know, what indicators can help, you know, from bread to, you know, just general um, economic information, what indicators can help us see conflict coming. And in the past, there really hasn't been much success. And a lot is because um, politics is nuanced and culture is nuanced. And the way that people use language to talk about it in different places changes. Um, but I actually just last night got back from San Francisco and met with a couple of groups that aren't there yet, but are really doing some interesting stuff with large scale, and here I go with the, large, the big data, but um, large scale analytics that include sentiment analysis and a lot of um, more nuanced uh, analysis across different languages. Um, so just staying on top of those trends and really look at what, what's happening in the private sector as well. I think the development doesn't look enough at what our colleagues are doing to sell Samsung phones or, you know, fiats. Um, and we can learn a lot from that because they're looking at these markets for a specific thing and how do we use those same tools to really understand a little bit more about, you know, stability in those places. There, uh, there's a saying we have around development C that data likes to touch other data. And you learn a lot of stuff when you get different sorts of data to start to play together. And that requires that it be open, it be, it be fungible, it be possible to, uh, for you to, 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 do, to get those data sets to work together. And that's when you can start to ask those interesting questions and continue to be inquisitive and continue to be honest to yourself about what's going on. And so oh, that, that's, when, that's why open data is important. Uh, and there are still key data sets, really important data sets about disaster and conflict that are funded through, uh, through public funds that are not really open or accessible in the way that you would want them to be. So I think that's a first step. Let's, let's open up those data sets. And data liking to touch other data, I think, is where you're veering into the creepy portion of the... <laughs>
be very opinionated about. Uh, I mean, have it make it a conversation, don't, uh, but like we should be the ones who are setting the standard about what's responsible to do with data and encouraging the donors to adopt that and spread that, not the other way around. Great. Uh, when we talk about ICT, that's information and communication technologies, in the digital age, is it inevitable to deal with some countries where ICT is limited or it's even filtered by those with their own agenda? And asking just to reflect on that. Absolutely. Right? I mean, that's the environment that, that we're working in, right? In, in, you know, if you're talking to somebody in, in uh, Myanmar, you're talking to somebody in a city, right? I mean, if you're calling them on a phone or Skype or whatever, that's where they're going to be. But it's changing rapidly. In, in each of these countries, the, the problem really with technology is the specifics of the context drive so much of what you can do. This is why I really want to rely on local technologists more than anything else. Because yes, I know that Skype is available in Dakar, but I don't really know all the surrounding stuff of what they're using it for. I know when I call there, for some reason, it's worse than almost anywhere else but a few other countries. But pick your country, pick your context. The, the, the specifics of what's driving Egypt right now is very different from Iraq, which is very different from Burma, and the technology landscape looks completely different in each of those countries. So if I'm trying to figure out how to engage, if I'm not connecting with the local tech community, you're really losing the best opportunity to figure out what's possible and what's easy. Yeah, so in 2007, um, I, you know, I was at NDI, we'd done a few programs with SMS and election observation, and uh, we thought we were getting pretty good at it. And I was sent to Sierra Leone, pretty much specifically because the country office there thought they were going to use mobile phones in, in, in collecting data on the elections. And I was basically sent to convince them that that was a bad idea, because this is Sierra Leone, right? Uh, and how could we possibly do something with mobile in 2007 in Sierra Leone? We got there and actually started trying to figure out what's the right way to do this. We would get out to the rural areas where the only way to get information was a 10-mile bike ride to a place where there was a, um, a, you know, a, a hospital that had a CB radio to get to the state capital and then send it in. But we f what we found was that actually mobile phones were an important part of that communication. If, we were, if you were asking people what's the fastest way to get this information to Freetown, it was always going to involve mobile phones in some way. And so those areas that are most information deprived, where there are blocks on what people can get and what they can't, where there isn't much infrastructure, it's those places that data makes the most difference. And where very small and smart investments in technology and data can, can be very, very impactful. Dropping off 200 iPads is almost always the wrong idea in every program. Stop putting that into your proposals. Uh, but smart applications of, and appropriate applications of technology in the hardest environments can make the biggest difference. That means Android tablets, not iPhones. Yeah. yeah. All of them. Just stop yeah. dropping off tablets. <laughs> totally. Um, I also want to add that approaching things strategically, you don't always need to go for the thing that is most threatening. Um, and going back to kind of what Noel's talking about is building this local capacity to even understand what's possible um, and using non-threatening ways, you know, help people envision how to use technology for agriculture or for uh, lowering infant mortality or something that everybody can get behind, including the government. Um, and then once those tools are there and people actually understand the possibility, they'll take it where they want to. They're not going to, you know, forget how to, you know, get people um, excited about a Facebook page and things like that. So, you know, starting small, I know we have a project in Uzbekistan um, that has an, that's an agricultural project that we have put our guides out for pest and disease on an app, um, and it's wildly po popular, and we're disseminating it through farmer associations, partly because um, getting it in a format where it can be downloaded and using the telecommunications infrastructure is just not politically uh, possible or easy at this point. Um, but it will get its own legs and it will it'll start to kind of push those boundaries a little bit more. Great, and our last question focuses on social media and recognizes the fact that it can be used for, us, for organizations to do outreach um, for us as donors to inform our monitoring and evaluation, 
um, and to help us to understand what's going on in fluid environments. So I guess turning it back to the panelists, um, where do you see the greatest potential in those areas, um, either in your own work, working on projects, um, and then also we could turn it back to OTI. Um, I would say that the potential is in all of it, <laughs> um, and using, know -how, using it strategically. Um, DAI was the implementer of an OTI project in Tunisia, where for the longest time we weren't using social media all that much until one day I got a call asking how to make a video go viral, and I was like, whoa, <laughs> we can't just, <laughs> <laughs> it's a viral just yeah, it's you just, just viral. you call this guy, and, and then you're like number one on YouTube. Um, <laughs> But I think what, what we took away from that was um, it, it opened the door to that conversation where, where we actually started today um, and talked about what was possible. And when I went out to their project, um, all of the staff was using it. I actually did a, a poll where people raised their hands, how it kept it. I've used it one time a day, two times, three times. One guy had used it 10 times a day and was willing to admit that in front of his boss. <laughs> um, but we saw that we were like, the Tunisian population was definitely using social media, but we weren't necessarily leveraging that to amplify the impact that our grants were having. Um, and part of it was people were making a lot of assumptions. Um, one, they were making an assumption that, that you know, OTI didn't necessarily want it because it could be risky. What if someone posted something negative about the US? We were also making an assumption that it was just urban liberal folks, but when we went out and saw, uh, found a survey that had been done by a local social media firm, or a local media firm, found that while 39% of people were on the internet and 33% of people were on Facebook, 100% of Tunisians that were surveyed had reported accessing Facebook at one point. And when you looked at those who got information, whether it was firsthand or secondhand from, some, from social media, it was the entire population. So that really was a marking point in our project where we started to really leverage that a lot more, posting videos from events, publicizing events, doing reminders, and really using it to collect momentum behind a, you know, a, a kind of unification campaign, so. I'd, I'd add that, um when you think about social media, the first thing that you might want to do what that's important is to really understand the, the, the media ecology behind it. So a word like virality, basically, when we use it, what we're saying is we don't know what happened. <laughs> right? But actually, we do mostly know what happens. When, and we can investigate each one of those moments and instances of viral, so-called virality. And we can see that there is actually a visible chain of behavior. And there's a whole field of study that looks into how information flows across um, network societies. Um, so if you think about uh, social media as an opportunity to um, promote or strategically communicate your content, you're kind of missing the greatest thing about social media, which is that no one's really in control of it, except for the company that owns the platform you're using, of course, but that's a separate panel. <laughs> um, if for a moment we presume that they're in aggregate, there's still the possibility of working with social media networks in which people have the, the ability to own and control some aspects of them, then the greatest value is that you are actually in a context, in an environment in which you're talking to everybody more or less equally, or you have that opportunity, and things are going to happen in that space that you might not be aware of and might not be predicting, and that's really good actually, and you want to embrace that idea because you'll find out really quickly whether the things that you're working on are relevant to people. And, um, and, and if they don't like your work, they'll tell you, and that's good knowledge to have too. So I would encourage you to absolutely use those tools, but use them with the awareness that um, you're opening yourself up to a conversation that is going to go everything from questions about power to questions about the nature of your work and your ability to do it well to, of course, inevitably you'll wind up dealing with trolls. And you want to be able to deal with that too if you're going to because it will be there. So. Yeah, I mean, this is somewhere that, again, we're getting back to how we reorganize ourselves. There, just like in real life, nobody just, the, the, a social media uh, um, approach that would be ineffective is just shouting. Right, just like, it would be like going down the, the road with a megaphone and expecting to have a conversation with people. Um, the right media, the right social media approaches involve actual engagement, 
it, like talking to people like it's a meeting, like it's a, like it's a cocktail party, like it's a, a rally, like actually being a participant in that. And you don't do that well if you have the social media person in DC that's responsible for posting all of the tweets and Facebook posts and all that, because that person isn't connected to your program, what you're doing isn't, doesn't, isn't knowledgeable. You're never gonna be successful in social media if that is your approach. What you need to do is unleash your staff, unleash your, your experts to be more open on these platforms about why they're doing, why we're doing what we're doing, and, and trust them to be knowledgeable enough to engage in these conversations without having to get a clearance or blessing from the, the, you know, the executive office every time they want to engage in those spaces. Then there is a chance, maybe less than 50%, but there's at least a chance that you will be successful in, in your social media and you'll be able to get the sort of benefits that Ivan talks about. Two quick points. One of the interesting things for social media in, in, in conflict zones and in developing countries is its potential for reverse mentoring. Right, so so many of these larger NGOs are headed by you know gray-haired folk who are interested in technology, not sure, but probably you're not going to be doing the Twitter thing all the time. But here now, there is this opportunity where the twenty-somethings can move their organization to a very different place. So creating spaces where it's comfortable for them to get that reverse mentoring and really open up their local organizations to that, I think, is terrific. The other point, just throwing a bone to Facebook and, and the like. Uh, People that have been to developing countries, why is Coca-Cola so successful there, right? People don't trust the soft drinks that their own countries are making. Is it polluted? Is there poison? Chances are Coke is going to start with clear water. It's going to have a lot of sugar, but it's probably not going to kill me today. You know, 20 years, that's a different situation. I think there's a corollary to Facebook, right? So yes, we talk about the problems of corporate ownership of all of our platforms, which is truly problematic on a lot of levels. But if you're in a somewhere like a Burma, which is just now sort of opening up its environment, and you can't even get the you know, rights to create your own newspaper, it's no surprise that there's multiple newspapers only published on Facebook, right? You can ask, in, in so many of these countries, you look at the percentage of internet penetration, and it's almost identical to the penetration for Facebook. And they're probably doing it you know, for a good reason, but, but on the same token, I think the, the Edward Snowden stuff just really drives confidence to the floor in those platforms and is really detrimental on a way that you're seeing the IT companies address it. But there's a real advantage to having this international platform that everybody in the world is using and now you're in one of these places that's just now getting connected. It makes a lot of sense to go there and it is good in the same way that Coke is good and potentially bad, right? So. <laughs> Analogy works. <laughs> we have four minutes left and a last note card. What can be done to hold meetings online and help local people to decide on projects? Um, so just a quick coda to the last point, which is that one of the wonderful and scary things about living in a network society is that Everything you say, even in a closed room like this, relatively closed room, which is now being videotaped and shared with the world, has potentially impacts somewhere else. So even though right now we're all talking together, the language that we use and the gestures and the, the messages that we send with the languages, the language that we have today has in a, is, is visible elsewhere. And I think it's really important to be aware that if you're engaging in social media, to know that your language, your perspectives, and the, the ideas that you share will be interpreted differently in different contexts. And so if we speak about countries in generalities, like countries in conflict, an individual in that country might say, why am I being classed in that way in that room in Washington? What does that mean? What is the projection of authority that comes from that idea? So I just like, like as a very simple level, if you think about and, and to understand the effects of networks. If you just think about every time you open your mouth, that you're not just talking to somebody else in this room, but you're talking potentially to everybody. It will change your behavior. And that's an interesting effect. So that's, I think, a really important idea that I hope you'll, you'll consider. And that takes me pretty nicely into the next question. How do we hold meetings? How do we build spaces? Um, now, there's so many ways to hold meetings, and there's a whole suite of tools and applications out there in the world that attempt to facilitate virtual communication and global voices. The 
organization with which I work does not, is entirely virtual and we spend all of our time trying to answer that question. And there are some things that virtual tools do really well, like asynchronous communica communication, um, the ability to kind of work collectively on documents, very important, very useful. And then there are ideas and projects that really don't work in virtual spaces, in my experience. Um, you lose a huge amount of communication when we're just using voice or just using text. And um, there are times when you really want to bring people together face to face for larger strategic conversations. And so what I would say is think about the goal of your conversation and your, and your, your particular meeting and then try to find the level of application of tool that's appropriate without going super deeply into all the huge variety of suite, suite of tools. Yeah, I was going to ask if that was a t trick question. <laughs> um, I really think that the, the better question to ask here would be how do we bring communities together in discussion um, and what options are available to us and not jumping to online. Um, and I think that's the, the biggest takeaway from, from this panel is let, it is so easy with all this technology be, technology available to just jump there and go there and say, well, this is obviously going to make it easier. Um, but see technology and all the various tools that um, Global Voices has, that Development Seed has, that Noel is exploring with um, local communities as a toolbox, along with the community forums and the debates and the working groups and the key informant trainings and all of these different things. Um, and then pick what's right for that communication and what's going to get you the best result. I'm going to take it a slightly different way, but circle back to Jessica's great opening point, which is if you, if you are going to have a conversation with, with constituents, beneficiaries, people uh, do program design with communities, and, and you're not actually having an authentic conversation. You are like, oh, we can't actually work on the stuff that you care about because the donor asked for something else, <laughs> and we're not. We're going to get all your ideas and put them in the proposal, but we're probably never going to talk to you again. And all of this stuff. It doesn't matter what technologies you use. That will not be a successful endeavor. But if you actually are authentic and change the way that you generate ideas, change the way that you work, change your accountability to be to those communities rather than to the people who are giving you money, then it doesn't matter what technology you use, those will be successful conversations. And in the spirit of still seeing the value of face-to-face -face communication, I need to break us for lunch, but we look forward to continuing this conversation with you. Our panelists will be sticking around for a little while. I want to thank them so much for giving their time today, and thank you as an audience for joining us. Hey guys. Yeah, that was fun. I really like that. I like the new one.